So I, I got into this field from a background in sort of plant medicine. I've grown kind of every, you know, psychoactive and medicinal plant of interest that you can think of since I was a teenager. Um, and then at some point realized that if you study organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry, you can not only understand how sort of bioactive substances are, are working in the human body, but actually start to design new ones yourself and sort of optimize on what nature's given us. And so this has been sort of a, a major thrust of a lot of the work that I've done, um, just really trying to get to the bottom of, of how all these like fascinating molecules that nature provides can be sort of modified and, and understanding what they're doing to us. So yeah, a little bit unusual. I'm not presenting any plant medicines in this session, but I, you know, just to appreciate that I come from a sort of background in this area and I have a lot of interest in, in the natural world. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot for, for attending the session. Um, today's talk's titled Psychedelics 2.0 and Beyond because I had to come up with something pretty quickly for the program and didn't really have time to think it through. Um, what, what I mean by this is just sort of an overview of the next generation of, of psychedelic medicine that's occurring right now beyond the classical uses of, of psilocybin and other things. Um, so just a few disclosures. I have uh, done consulting work for a number of different companies. These are sort of companies um, based broadly in, in biotechnology with an interest in um, you know, bioactive natural products and, and derivatives thereof. Um, as mentioned, I'm currently co-founder um, of Silo. That's, that's my, kind of my full-time role, so quite relevant to this talk today. So there's a, a huge amount going on with psychedelics as medicine um, at the moment, as, as everyone in this room would be aware, and, and this whole um, quite revolutionary mode of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, is pretty exciting for anyone who's working in psychiatry. So the psychiatrist toolbox has been pretty much the same since um, you know, SSRI has been the last major innovation you know, th more than 30 years ago now. Um, and I'm sure just statistically several people in this room are probably on SSRIs right now um, can probably attest to the fact that they're often not very good for a lot of people. Um, so, so there is something pretty exciting going on with psychedelic medicine at this point, and there's a huge amount of interest as a result. Um, what's really exciting to me is that we keep seeing this sort of modality being expanded. So you're now seeing trials being announced with, with classical psychedelics um, for eating disorders, for substance use disorders, so well beyond sort of depression and PTSD and the anxiety, the earlier indications that were being explored. Um, we've got some very large phase two and phase three studies now being completed, um, and it's very likely that on the back of these studies, psilocybin itself will be an approved, FDA approved medicine by 2024. MDMA is likely to be the same. Um, and the FDA has recognized this with this sort of breakthrough therapy designation for these substances, which says, you know, the FDA has accepted that they perform substantially better than what exists currently, and they're willing to sort of expedite the approval process. So it's, it's pretty exciting times for a lot of patients, um, and I think we're going to see expanded applications of a lot of these drugs. Um, just as a quick overview of what's happening in the space, and if, if you told you know, teenage me that this is where we would be in, in 2022, I wouldn't have believed you, but um, when I was looking for postdocs, there was about three labs in the world doing psychedelic chemistry. Um, now we've got more than 100 companies working in this space, a whole bunch of academic labs and, and institutions, um, and a huge amount of sort of capital flowing in, um, for better or for worse, based on some of the talks yesterday. Um, what, what's really interesting is that beyond sort of health tech and, and broader healthcare um, vertical integrals, you sort of have a, a lot of companies working on drug development. And I, I think it's interesting that they, they class themselves as drug development companies when a lot of these companies are doing what I consider pretty low hanging fruit modifications of existing psychedelics. So usually to claim some sort of, um, you know, commercial moat of some kind. I, I don't view it as particularly innovative, a lot of it. Tweaking what nature has given us in very minor ways is not really very innovative to my way of thinking. So most of the psychedelics um, that people will be familiar with come from three structural classes. So we have phenethylamines, and I've got mescaline there as a pretty classic example. There's a whole suite of those um, that were explored by people like Shulgin and, and Daryl Lemaire and others. We have ergolines, you know, most famously sort of, um, most famously represented by LSD and, and a whole host of other things that were discovered by Hoffman and people have worked on since. And then tryptamines, which is sort of like a simplified ergoline scaffold. So this includes psilocybin, DMT, 5-MeO-DMT. Um, so all of the hundreds, pr probably thousands at this point of known psychedelics uh, come from these three classes of molecules, which is pretty limited in terms of structural diversity. Um, obviously these drugs were not designed for our use, so nothing that a plant makes is really intended for us. You can take a sort of anthropocentric view that it is, that we're all very special and nature's out there making all this cool stuff directly for us, but that's, that's not really how it works um, from an evolutionary perspective. So it's a, it's a really interesting coincidence that we grew up in the same sort of primordial soup, and therefore our receptors interact with these really interesting molecules that nature's also producing. Um, like many drugs, you know, a lot of our drugs are inspired by nature, directly or indirectly, but they're not intended for our use, and therefore they're sort of subject to some optimization. So in a, a purely practical sense, one of the biggest issues with the rollout of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, and the reason psilocybin's used instead of LSD, is the duration of action. So 
that's going to be a major barrier to sort of broad deployment of these, these drugs is that, you know, you need two therapists under the current model, a six to eight hour treatment session. It's really pretty intensive work. Um, so if you can reduce the duration of action of some of these drugs, you might be in a better position for, for treating more patients. Um, something that's not really talked about that I'll cover in a little bit is, is off-target activity that's a risk for side effects um, when we're considering sort of non-traditional uses of these substances. So acute dosing of psychedelics, pretty acutely non-toxic. Um, but if you're taking them every day in a microdosing type setting, there, there are some risks there that I think are not super well explored at this point. Um, and there's this really interesting emerging field that's still to be clinically validated but shows some very good preclinical evidence that you can actually maybe tease apart the hallucinogenic effect of psychedelics and maintain some of the positive therapeutic effects, which is a, a really interesting area when you think about people who for um, comorbid, uh, comorbid psychiatric illnesses or, or other reasons can't actually take or don't want to take a psychedelic. So Silo was sort of formed to, um, to develop compounds across these classes. So we're using like really modern advances in computational chemistry to generate sort of new chemical entities. And the overall goal is to, to achieve this really exquisite functional selectivity. So quite tailored medicines for, for different patient populations. Um, so essentially next generation therapeutics are inspired by psychedelics from nature. Seem to be stuck. Oh, maybe just lagged. So the reason that psychedelics do anything um, in our bodies at all, uh, psilocin's a really great example. You can see here it's 4-hydroxydimethyltryptamine. Um, pretty, pretty simple even as a non-chemist to recognize that structurally, in a two-dimensional sense, it looks pretty similar to 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin. Um, so this is the basis for a lot of psychedelic action, is that these molecules occupy a number of different receptors that we already have endogenous uh, transmitters and, and receptor systems for. Um, there's 14 different serotonin receptor subtypes, um, a whole host through the 5-HT1 family, 5-HT2, 3. 5-HT3 is actually an ion channel. It's the only one of these receptors that's not a, a G-protein coupled receptor. Um, and all of these um, GPCRs are actually extremely important for, for drug development. So a lot of tryptans that are developed for treating migraines by vasoconstriction are agonists of various 5-HT1 receptor subtypes. Um, we know very little about things like 5-HT5A because we haven't had tools for studying these receptors until recently. So it's, it's very likely most of these will be very important for drug development. Um, of particular note to psychedelics, 5-HT1A uh, is a sort of anti-anxiety target for some drugs and is very important for things like 5-MeO-DMT, um, things of that class. The primary psychedelic receptor is 5-HT2A, um, and 5-HT2C is also an important drug target that sort of modulates some of the activity at 2A in a functionally selective way uh, in vivo. So the main point of this slide is just that we have this whole host of different receptors. Psychedelics are not very clean drugs like a lot of natural products are. They actually interact with many of these different receptors, and there's commonalities to these profiles and also in some important differences ac across the classes. Um, almost all of them hit 5-HT2B, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's a potential issue for microdosing in just a moment. Um, they show different receptor expression patterns throughout the brain, um, and that's consistent with their sort of different functions in the body. So this is just a, a recent sort of model, an animation based on a structure, structural information from crystallography um, of an LSD type molecule bound to 5-HT2A. I think this is actually technically 5-HT2B, but you know, for all practical purposes, you can consider it as, as 2A. Um, and, and this is just to highlight that we have this phenomenal amount of very high level structural information at sort of atomic resolution now about how these drugs are actually interacting with proteins of interest. And we can leverage this in all sorts of interesting ways um, using the power of sort of computer aided drug design. So one of the biggest risks for microdosing that's sort of being explored at, at, at the moment is this idea of 5-HT2B agonism leading to valvular heart disease. Um, and the reason we know this is a risk is because of a drug called Fenfen. So Fenfen was a combination, um, a diet drug essentially, that was a combination of fentamine, a stimulant, and fenfluramine, which is a 5-HT2C, sorry, 5-HT2C agonist. Um, fenfluramine produces this metabolite that was not really well studied at the time that's actually a very potent agonist of 5-HT2B. So a lot of people were taking this drug even for as little as several months, people who were otherwise healthy, as a diet aid, ended up getting sort of overstimulation of 5-HT2B and developed this very serious sort of life-threatening heart disease. Um, as a result, fenfen was pulled from the market. Um, there was about $13 billion in, in damages sought by various complainants in lawsuits. Uh, and you know, this is now a drug development uh, anti-target, a sort of liability. So 
sort of of interest here is that things like psilocin, the active metabolite of psilocybin, is actually a more potent agonist of 2B than it is of 2A, its sort of intended um, primary receptor. So one of the things that's really interesting uh, with all of the microdosing trends, which is not really a traditional use for these drugs, is that we just don't have any real world evidence on whether the receptor activation that's being achieved with those sorts of doses is likely to cause an issue um, in the long term. Uh, and it's interesting to hear people, people who are pretty close to Shulgin. I've, I've spent some time with the Shulgins um, from when I was living in California. Some of um, Sasha's colleagues have mentioned that you know, he ended up having a valve replacement later in life, and he was testing a whole bunch of these different agonists that were also 5-HT2B agonists on himself. So you know, one sort of anecdote, but it's very likely this could be a, a potential risk for some people. So the future of psychedelics um, is really about sort of optimizing these drugs and looking at interesting new uses for them. And so I'm always amazed at how far we're moving beyond the basic sort of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy model and into even more interesting areas of ne neurology. So you've got people like Charles Nichols showing that drugs like DOI at a 30th of the psychedelic dose can actually treat uh, asthma in a mouse model and in several other models as well. So that's, that's kind of interesting. It suggests there's some other sort of really interesting biochemistry going on that's mediated by the 2A receptor and there may be even broad applications for these drugs. Um, you've got people looking at whether DMT uh, may actually be useful in stroke recovery via its action at 2A and at another receptor called SIMU1. Um, and this has led to a, a trial in stroke patients at this point in time that's planning to explore whether DMT might be useful for recovery there. And then a slightly older body of work looking at how psychedelics can treat various headache disorders. Um, and I'm sure people in this room would probably know um, those suffering from migraines or cluster headaches who've treated themselves with LSD or psilocybin. Um, I've, I've got a friend who's treated his own cluster headaches with DMT. Um, very effective, but you know, not super practical uh, if you've got to take LSD to abort this, this crazy headache, but then still got to work you know, on site doing something half important. So there may be ways to, to leverage some of the benefits of these drugs and remove, you know, in some cases, things like headache disorders, the hallucinogenic effects may be considered sort of a side effect. So it may be possible to tease these apart. And that's what we're looking at. So we're developing a number of different products um, at Silo. One of these is a sort of shorter acting psychedelic with a psilocybin-like profile for oral dosing. So this is intended to allow more patients to be treated um, per day at, at various clinics that will likely roll out with the approval of psilocybin. We're also looking at longer acting psychedelics, and this is of, of relevance to those who are interested in microdosing. Um, you'll hear from Vince later in this session about the potential benefits of repeated lower doses of psilocybin in, in moderate depression. Um, currently, if you were to use psilocybin for that sort of treatment, it, we don't know, but it's possible that you'd end up with valvular heart disease as a result with repeated use. So teasing out that sort of 2B activity and, and focusing on the other receptors is important there. And then this emerging class of sort of non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogens as, the, as they're being called. So compounds that can induce the neuroplasticity of psychedelics without causing um, full hallucinogenic effects or reduce sort of a hallucinogenic profile. Um, so the way this works is that we design molecules using a combination of sort of medicinal chemistry techniques um, and a lot of computer-aided drug design. We then synthesize those molecules either here or in partnership with, with labs in other parts of the world. Um, we screen these in different um, cellular systems. So those, the, the initial screens involve these 5-HT receptors that I've mentioned being expressed in different cell types and looking at a fluorescent endpoint. Um, we also look at neurons, neuronal models of, of sort of plasticity um, to, to, talk, to develop these sorts of compounds that I mentioned earlier, these psychoplastogens. Um, finally, we move to in vivo assays where we can look at sort of animal models of disease, but also uh, a very reliable animal model of hallucinogenic activity and eventually into clinical trials with the most op uh, optimized candidates. So a lot of chemists in this area, you know, Alexander Shulgin, Daryl Lemaire, Dave Nichols, a lot of people have provided the groundwork for sort of rational design in this space. And, and I like to put this slide up as, as someone who, had, you know, never got to meet Sasha, but I've, I've had lunch with Anne, I've spent a bit of time at the farm, and I've, I've followed this work very, very closely. Um, Shulgin was doing something, you know, really interesting. He made a bunch of money for Dow by developing Zectran, this interesting insecticide, and they gave him a super long leash, and what he decided to do with that was make hundreds of psychedelics and publish them in medicinal chemistry journals, um, along with his own self-experiments. And eventually Dow said, you know, we'd prefer that you don't do that, please. And <laughs> He set up his own lab at his home um, just outside Berkeley in California. So he was interested in the structural features of mescaline that give rise to its activity. Um, so one of the things you can do here is, is add a sort of amphetamine tailbone, an alpha methyl group, to give TMA. So that's just trimethoxyamphetamine. And his reasoning was that in amphetamine, this, this serves two functions. Um, it increases the lipophilicity of the drug, so it gets into the brain better, um, and it, it extends um, metabolism, you know, mod, uh, 
fortifies against metabolism. So when you apply this to mescaline, you, sure enough, you get a drug that's more potent orally, and it lasts for a little bit longer. And then he sort of discovered the importance of these substituent effects around the ring. So you can make TMA2 by shuffling those methoxy groups. You get a drug that's even more potent again. It's more optimized for interaction with the 2A receptor and others, um, and a very extended duration. And if you start combining other features, really exploring that four position, you get things like the DO series. So DOB, um, a bromine in place of one of those methoxy groups, and you know, you've got a drug that's fully active at one milligram, a very, very potently psychedelic agent that lasts for about 30 hours. So um, these are all interesting tool molecules. I don't think anyone really wants a 30-hour psychedelic. It's, it's a pretty long time. Maybe some people do, but I, I don't think most people want that. But we can use these same sorts of tricks applied to any other class of psychedelics to really rationally probe interactions between the, the molecules on the receptor. So you, you load up any news site these days and you, you see increasing amounts of um, you know, hype around how psychedelic drugs are sort of resetting the brain, inducing neuroplasticity. Um, and there's likely to be a lot of truth to, to this, to some of this at least. Um, but there is this sort of emerging idea that one of the ways biochemically that, that psychedelics are working is by sort of um, reopening these critical learning periods, things that close off um, once you're no longer a teenager and your ability to learn uh, becomes sort of more rigid and restricted. Uh, there's sort of an idea that for some psychiatric illnesses, they have sort of an obsessive component or that the, the mind sort of uh, more fixed in its thought patterns and that psychedelics allow this to be sort of more malleable once again. So this is some data from a lab at UC Davis run by Dave Olson, who's, who's a big proponent of this idea. Um, when you look at the changes that these drugs are inducing in neurons, um, we get sort of a lot of the hallmarks of, of classic neuroplasticity, which is uh, neurons forming new connections in the brain in a very um, sort of structural sense. So LSD, DMT, DOI, quite a few other psychedelics will do this, uh, largely via 2A mediated mechanisms. Um, and you get things like increased neurite outgrowth on these neurons, um, synaptogenesis, of so the, the forming of new synapses, uh, all sorts of things that are consistent with you know, the brain changing and adapting itself in a way that may be useful. Uh, and what's really interesting is that the field still can't agree uh, even with everyone studying at the moment, people with decades of experience on how important these sort of neuroplastic changes are to the effects of these drugs in the clinic. Um, so I, I did really like this article in ACS Pharmacology and Translational Science where they bookended an editorial from Roland Griffiths, who everyone should know pretty well for running a lot of the end of life psilocybin anxiety studies. Um, with Dave Olson, who I just mentioned. You know, the subjective effects of psychedelics are necessary for their enduring therapeutic effects, and that's on the basis of people self-reporting mystical type experiences correlating with therapeutic benefit. And then right next to that, you've got an editorial from Dave Olson. The subjective effects of psychedelics may not be necessary for their enduring therapeutic effects. So it, it's still an open question. There's a lot of really exciting science being done at the moment in this area. So this is, this is the one that sort of blew me away when I started digging a little bit deeper into this space. I've done drug design for mu opioid receptors, the target of morphine, um, for cannabinoid receptors, CB1, target of THC. Usually with, with a lot of these GPCRs, you have a, a main binding pocket, an orthosteric site. If you can design a molecule that binds there, for morphine, you know, you get analgesia, you get constipation, respiratory depression, you get all the usual effects. For cannabinoids, you know, you get intoxication, you know, uh, the munchies, sedation, all the usual effects that you would get from a lot of other um, CB1 agonists. The super interesting thing about psychedelics um, is that structurally it's very hard to determine what will give you a psychedelic effect. So I've shown on the top here three different molecules, LSD, 5-fluoro-MET is a new compound from Gilgamesh, and 5-MEO-DMT everyone should know. You make very slight structural changes to any of these, and the molecules on the bottom are actually not hallucinogenic at all. Um, so two bromo, LSD, BOL14A, is actually one of these non-hallucinogenic compounds that's being developed for headache disorders. The way we can test whether a psychedelic drug without eating it um, is active in, or likely to be hallucinogenic in mice is with this head twitch response assay. Um, so this is just a video from, I think it was uploaded by Alex Kwan from his lab. If you have a look at the mouse on the left, you'll see it sort of shake its head. So this mouse has been dosed with a psychedelic agent, um, and it gives, literally just looks like a, a little head shake. Um, this is a very reliable effect that's induced by psychedelics. It's, it's sort of predictive of human potency of these drugs as well when you study a lot of substances. So there's now automated methods using sort of high frame rate cameras and contrast scoring where you can basically give the mouse the drug, monitor it um, you know, from above, and literally just count the head, uh, head shakes, uh, head twitches, and, and from there determine you know, how potent your drug is as a psychedelic. Um, so we're using that model to sort of work out whether we've developed a, a psychoplastogen class of drug or a sort of new fully hallucinogenic psychedelic. Uh, 
Uh, and the sort of last area that I'd like to just touch on briefly is this really exciting space um, of high throughput virtual screening. And, and there's been a big paper in Nature recently from Brian Roth's lab with a number of people at UNC, UCF, and Stanford um, looking for, in a, in a very rational way, from the vastness of chemical space, drugs that are likely to have antidepressant properties um, but not actually induce hallucinations. So the basic idea here is that you can take a model. This is not actually the 2A receptor. I had to cheat and just find a, I think it's actually a thrombin receptor or something. But you can take these um, structural models of receptors that have been developed using methods like cryogenic electron microscopy or X-ray crystallography. Um, you know, you port them into a, a digitized format, and then you can pull from these enormous libraries of tens of billions or hundreds of billions of molecules, of virtual molecules, things that are theorized to be able to be synthesized, and literally just start docking those at these receptors, like a you know, baseball in a glove. So we've done this for 2A with a 100 million compound virtual library that were pre-filtered for sort of drug likeness, um, good drug-like properties, you know, no toxicity, um, no expected toxicity. You can rank those in terms of score, and from this set, we've identified you know, about 1,600 new compounds that are likely to bind with 2A. And from that set, we started clustering them into various common chemotypes, um, like with the ergolines and tryptamines that I mentioned earlier. And from those new chemotypes, we can pull out representative examples that probe the features, sort of like Shulgin was doing, and then throw those into our 2A receptor model to see if they actually activate the receptor. So we have identified um, a number of different 2A agonists using this method. Um, we've experimentally validated several of those now, and these now serve as a sort of starting point for these um, entirely new areas of um, psychedelic drug discovery, which is pretty exciting. Um, and just a, a little video here of um, us playing around with one of these molecules in a receptor. So we can bring some pretty cool stuff like VR to this space. Um, and this is with a company called Nanome. So you put on a VR headset um, with a bunch of scientists. So these, these are people from Nanome, some of our computational chemists um, and some of our medicinal chemists with one of these molecules that they've docked into the receptor. And you can actually get right in there, like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids style, and start seeing where different features of that molecule are interacting with different features of the, the receptor itself. So it forms sort of like a... Yeah, truly like a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids collaborative drug discovery space. <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty amazing to be able to bring all of these tools that weren't available before prohibition to this sort of rational drug development effort. Um, and if you, if you want to know more about this space, we run sort of a, a community-focused sort of newsletter that's intended for a, a generalist audience. Um, you can sign up on our website. I've got a, a figure here. So this is made by um, Dr. Delara Bacecci, who's our science, uh, science communications officer. Um, it includes a nice sort of 60, uh, science in 60 seconds focus on like a, a key concept in, in drug discovery or in psychedelics. It's got a list of all the current clinical trials, some of the more exciting um, research papers that are coming out. And it's, yeah, it's a pretty good resource if you want something in your inbox once a month that's a really quick overview of the space. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. That was amazing. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. If there are some questions, let me bring a mic around to you. I'll just get this gentleman down the back first. Cheers, Sam. Your talk's always mad. Um, so by pushing the idea of psychoplastogens, saying we can you know, tease apart the subjective effects of psychedelics from their presumably like therapeutic, purely physiological effects, such as anti-inflammatory effects and synaptogenic properties, um, what do you think of the value of the psychedelic experience then? Are you not implicitly positing that any philosophical insights that are to be had that have been commonly qualitatively reported in the literature um, by people who claim that they're getting psychological insight um, are actually just kind of meaningless. Um, and yeah, is the subjective experience not important at all in human life? And don't you think that there's a bit of a blind spot there by sort of being purely in this psychoplastogenic, like consciousness doesn't really, like qualia is unimportant sort of paradigm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I'm definitely a, a big subscriber to consciousness myself. Um, <laughs> I think, I don't think it's really, I don't see it as like a dichotomy. I think this is one of the, the key concerns. Some people in the psychoplastogen space certainly do view psychedelics as maybe not that useful. I, I actually take a completely different view. I think these are both very important therapeutic modalities and beyond, you know, beyond therapeutic um, sort of compounds as well. Um, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's, it's likely that psychoplastogens will entirely displace 
psychedelics and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy um, is clearly being you know, very useful for, for a lot of people. Um, we know that the subjective effects that people have do actually correlate with therapeutic outcomes in, with those drugs, which is one of the reasons that I'm not completely sold on the psychoplastogens idea either. Um, it, it's just too early to tell. There's certainly some good preclinical animal data. Once the clinical trials get underway, that'll be pretty exciting too. But the real value of those compounds that, that, that I perceive is that people who are contraindicated for psychedelics use, which is you know, not a small chunk of people who might benefit from other aspects of these drugs, they'll have new treatment options. So yeah, I, I don't view it as sort of an either or thing. I think it's both classes are extremely important. Thanks, one from over here. Um, I saw your talk at the Future of Drugs um, conference in Sydney. Um, so, excuse me if I've got this wrong, but I recall um, talk of a of discovery of a compound similar to MDMA with inherent anti-addictive properties. Ah, uh, yeah, you, you're probably thinking of uh, a, a molecule called KNX100 that was being That's developed. The one. Yeah, so being developed by a colleague of mine, um, a few colleagues of mine at a company called Canoxis. So this is uh, operating through what was thought to be an oxytocin-based mechanism. Uh, turns out that it's not purely oxy uh, oxytocin mediated, but it certainly is having some super interesting effects. So they've actually taken that molecule. Um, it in, in rodents, it has some MDMA-like properties. It increases um, sociability and, and cuddling and other things, um, but it's shown an incredible data in, in substance use disorders. So they've actually got a phase one trial running at the moment, funded by NIDA, looking at the use of that compound in, in opioid use disorder, and it's showing some pretty promising results uh, preclinically before they took it there. So um, yeah, pretty interesting company, super interesting molecule. Um, and yeah, I think they're, they're waiting to see what the clinical trials say with that one. Is there some indication as to how the anti-addictive part of this is working? For psychedelics or for KNX? No idea at all. The, the mechanism is still not entirely deconvoluted, so it's, it's, it's likely to be a, a truly new medicine that's doing something new and unique, which is why it's so exciting, yeah. Just going to squeeze one question in down the back here. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, the VR t technology you were showing and the resource at the end, like that is an amazing resource and drug literacy is kind of absent in the general population. Even health professionals aren't properly taught. Are you doing anything with that technology at, like to create educational resources as well as the, the drug design you're doing? Mm. The, the company that provides that software, Nanome, they do an enormous amount broadly across, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting idea. I don't know, they do a lot of chemistry education actually, so undergraduate and postgraduate chemistry learning tools. They do quite a lot of drug discovery education, um, but it is a, a generally useful tool. You can essentially create any sort of environment you want in there. Um, I, I haven't spoken to them explicitly about drug education, but yeah, it's a, it's a great idea for sure. Thanks so much for being part of uh, Garden State, Sam. Please, yeah, thanks, thanks so Sam, much. once more.